Greetings, this is Jared Love, and in this video I'm going to be going over how to set up a matrix constraint system for joints, specifically when you have joint orient issues that you're trying to resolve. And this is uh, coming from, I've had a few questions and comments in previous videos of how to actually do this with a joint, and the whole reason is the joint orient is throwing everything off. So just to quickly explain what's going on in this file, I've got a joint chain where this is the joint I'm going to be driving by this control and it has a buffer node above it to just absorb all that translation and rotation information so that I can still then zero out that control. And on the joint chain I also parented in this cube to the same parent node as this joint. Um, and so you can see its pivot information is, is here at the same spot. I just took the control points of this cube after I placed it here and rotated it and got it in position, and I moved it out here so that it's at the tip so that you could more easily see as I manipulate this control, if the tip joint is staying with that cube, then you know that it's actually working correctly um, because this is you know, obviously how you want it to behave translation and of course you know scale stuff like that so I'm gonna go ahead and connect in this joint to be driven by that same matrix constraint system so let's see rotate and scale and translate so you see right off the bat the joint has kind of rotated off all cattywampus from what it's supposed to be and you know, it, it's just, it feels odd when you're trying to manipulate it. And again, this is all coming from that joint orient. So there's the joint orient here and the actual rotation value from what this rotation taken out of this parent space is. And that's getting applied as rotation to this joint. So essentially you're doubling up that 60.255 so it's getting ro both rotations. Now, we can quote unquote fix this by zeroing out the join orient and you see now that this guy does rotate the way he should and you know, translation and scale of course is all working correctly. Uh, the problem is if you needed that join orient in there because this is the representing the default position of your joint, you now have rotations in this channel and you wanted that to be zero. That's the whole purpose, I guess, behind the joint orient. So let me just kind of undo this. I think that should be good. And I'm gonna go back in here and I'm gonna sever this rotation channel. And then I'm going to put this rotation back to zero. So, by just severing the rotation channel, we can still see that the scale and the translation is working correctly. It's just that pesky rotation. So what we have to do is create a different matrix. So uh, it's kind of weird, and I don't know in excruciating detail the inner workings of Maya to understand exactly, like 100%, what the joint orient is doing. but for all intents and purposes, it kind of behaves like a half parent, like halfway apparent, if that makes sense. So for the joint orient, it's kind of like um, the rotation of, of this, sorry, the parent space rotation of this joint comes from both the parent node and this joint's joint orient. So we kind of need to create a new world space rotation information that accounts for that joint orient. So the way we do that is uh, with this ex extra nodes in here. So the first thing I did was I created this compose matrix node. And what a compose matrix node does is you can input, translate, rotate, scale, you know, all that stuff. And it uses that information to create an actual matrix. So what we would do is we would take our joint orient and then plug that into the input rotate. And then if we look at this node, so we see that the input rotate is getting that rotation information and that is from the joint orient. And then down here, the actual matrix that it creates is this. 
Now this just represents that local space rotation. Uh, it's not a world space rotation at this point. So what we need to do is we'll first sever this and then fortunately it will retain that information that you plugged into it. So we don't actually need to keep that connection live or else it would create a cycle. And with join orients, once you set them, you don't ever need to modify them, or at least in most cases, it would be very rare and weird if you were to do that. So it's kind of like a static value at that point. So I'm gonna connect this output rotate here just to show that it's working, first of all, so you know I'm not just blowing a bunch of hot air. So you see as we rotate this around, the cube and the tip joint are staying in the same spot with each other and scaling is working, obviously translation is working. So, okay, so what's going on here? What is all this stuff? Uh, basically, what we're doing is, if you remember for the regular matrix constraint, what we're doing is we're taking the world matrix of what we're driving something with, we're getting the parent's inverse matrix, uh, that would be the inverse world matrix of the parent, and we're plugging that into our molt matrix as well. And then the output is going to give us the new translation rotation scale of the driver in that new local space, basically, that we need to drive the driven node with. So what we need to do is create a new world matrix representing that rotation that we can then feed in. And I did try very hard to make just a single system where I could plug the whole decompose matrix in, but I always ran into an issue where, uh, well, let me just show you. So we'll do this translation, connect that in. So you see how the joint is no longer there, and it's because due to the, like the world space position of all this stuff feeding in, this guy isn't getting the new positional data that it needs in order to create that new matrix. So I found that I need to split it up into two things where I have one matrix constraint system set up for getting just the translates and scales and then the other one will give me the rotation that I need. So we need to add the parent matrix and the rotation matrix of that join orient using this molt matrix to create a new world space matrix. And then because this is a molt matrix node, we don't have an easy way in this node to get the inverse matrix from it. So we have to use an inverse matrix node to feed it in and create the inverse matrix, which would be like the world inverse matrix. Then that is going to feed into this molt matrix, which at this point on is pretty much the same as this. It's just we take that world matrix of the driver, and then we're taking our new inverse world matrix, and we're feeding that in here, and then spitting that out into the rotate. So, as far as speed goes, if we take a look at this, um, what I did was... I took this scene as it is with all these nodes and, and the goal was to test different ways of connecting it and maintain all of the same transform nodes and stuff in the scene. So basically getting rid of the math nodes and stuff in favor of maintaining the cube, the joints and the driver as they are within the scene and all the connections just to have as small of a difference as possible between the different files to do the speed test with. So this first one up here is just taking, so I broke all the connections to the joint, so it has nothing there and I deleted those matrix nodes and stuff. So I kept only the ones that were constraining the cube to the driver and kept those connections. So that's what this first test is. So all the joints are still in the scene and it's only the cube that is connected. The second one, is the reverse of that. So the cube is no longer connected, however, the joint is connected, but the cube is still in the scene, it's just not connected. Then this file is where I blew away all of those matrix nodes and I just did a parent and a scale constraint from the driver to drive the joint. And then this last file is essentially the same as this, but I pruned the connections on the constraints to get rid of any cyclical connections. So 
the driven node connecting back into the constraint or the constraint connecting back into itself, all of those cyclical connections were severed. So doing the tests, so here's, you can kind of see the speeds of the different tests. So the regular matrix constraint on just the transform is the fastest for the most part. Uh, the parallel looks like it was a little bit slower just just a hair I mean not really that much and it could just be various background processes on my computer that led to that discrepancy you can see that the parallel of the joint getting constrained with the matrix system is slower it's it's the serial and parallel are just slightly slower than the regular transform but it is still slower and the DG evaluation mode is quite a bit slower. For the plane constraint, you can see even here that in DG, the matrix node system is actually faster. Uh, even the serial is faster, uh, but the parallel evaluation is not. The regular constraints are gonna be faster with parallel. And then just between the regular constraint and the prune constraint, you can see that the prune constraint is pretty consistently faster you know, across the board than the regular constraint. And that's just because, like I said, it's taking all of those cyclical connections, severing them and making essentially that information that should be static, static on the node. So uh, it doesn't have to do any kind of extra calculation loops to try and get all that information. So obviously the matrix constraint on a transform is going to be your fastest, but if you have to have the joint orient on that joint, then this will be faster for DG and serial, but slower for parallel. So it's going to depend on what evaluation mode your animators are using or, you know, any of that information. So just uh, take that information as it is. Uh, anyway, I hope this was helpful and I hope you got something out of it. Feel free to leave any comments or questions down in the comment section and have a blessed day.